it didn't happen, we didn't get the sheep. <laughs> and now it's a blizzard and we don't know where the sheep went. But we saw a three-year-old ram, two ewes and a lamb. And, um, I don't know, I guess we got about uh, 10 miles to go or something to get to uh, some firewood. We're almost out of food and uh, we don't have a map. <laughs> we don't know where we are. <laughs> Frickin' construction zone here. There's shit everywhere. I okay, got five more sheets to go on the ceiling for the sheet rock. And then uh, do the mudding and taping. Figure out what wood I'm gonna put for trim on that wall. Keep it going. But anyway, quick note, so here's the my phone that screwed up. It keeps we ran it through some program through Apple or something Sarah did on her Apple computer. And it wiped all my notes. All the emails are wiped clean, but for some strange reason, the photos and videos are still in my albums. Whatever. But this phone keeps shutting shutting down and then turning on again, like randomly every two or three minutes. So this phone's out. I gotta go buy another one. This is the old phone. The smaller one. Which didn't have all my notes on here and past emails. So I had to do some digging. But I had another folder I forgot about with 1,200 emails in it, not read, on, in my inbox, hidden on the Tell My Story. Anyway, I babbled. I got this. I got a whole bunch of emails here that I haven't heard ready to share, all right? And I'm slowly getting organized. But in the meantime, i got to make this quick note. The insanity that goes on the planet, you know, it's another reason why I've kind of been... I haven't gone straight into using the other channels yet because there's just so many people out there today pointing out the obvious, the insanity, the crazy ass shit that's going on. And I listen to a lot of them not so much lately because I find it's almost repetitive. And for the way my brain works is, you know, somebody points out a group of people being bad, all right? Criminals. Okay, I get it. Registered, understand it, seen the proof. I'm good, move forward. But what can frustrate my brain, how I work is, is the repetitive for months on end, pointing out the dark, dirty shit people are doing. And then six months later, they're still pointing it out. And it's hard not to point it out, it's hard not to go on rants about it, I get it. And I don't want to, for my, I don't want myself to slide in there and start doing the same thing. But I guess there is a plus to it when you have such a, a large audience as to be able to share the word with all of the people you can. I get that part of it too. It's just like with hunting, you know, if I go in a spot and I realize nothing's there, I, I can't waste time. Okay, nothing's here. I'm not going to keep going there and going there and going there and going there and wasting time. I'm going to keep moving. Moving forward. Do you know what I mean? My whole life has been about, my whole life has been about 
accumulating the knowledge, the intel, and moving forward on it, not staying there like a window licker gazing at the same valley, the same body of water, the same whatever, and not, and not moving on the knowledge that you're gaining. Do you know what I mean? What I'm trying to get at. There's a lot of people out there sharing a piss load of very helpful knowledge with a lot of people, but it's starting to get a little repetitive. I want some action. You know what I mean? We need to make a difference. You got to, people got to start doing things instead of just, oh man, did you see what those guys did today? Holy crap, the, 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 the insanity is crazy. And then they just go about their uh, regular routine. That's my one little uh, bow for this morning. One more, one more. So yesterday I had to go drive and I bought three of those plastic, what could be called a water tote. And they have the pipe, you know, the protective cage manufactured around them. So it's a plastic thousand liter tote with the, the cage around them. We've all seen them. There is literally probably millions of them just in North America, right? Excuse me. So I had to buy three of these things. And I asked the old, the old guy, I go, where do these come from? He says, oh, they're used for all sorts of different food, um, moving food, etc., like syrups. Like these ones over here were used for, used for uh, moving syrups, various syrup. I'm like, oh, all right. Because yeah, they're real easy to clean out. I'm like, okay. What about these clean ones here? So those were actually, they were vodka totes. They were toting vodka from, I guess, from these distillery places, right? I'm like, oh, wow, crazy. He goes, yeah, they're single. They only use them once and they, they chuck them. I'm like, what? What? These things are single use items? You've got to be kidding me. No way. He goes, yeah, because they can't guarantee the uh, that they're sanitized or they can be sanitized again. There's no guarantee when it comes to moving food. <laughs> well, maybe they could think of a better way to move the food items, right? So it was amazing to me on the, on that note and a little bit of insanity in our society and our our um, our crazy do-gooders when they have the war on straws. You know what I mean? That insane, that insane movement that was created by God knows who. I think it was a commercial with one turtle or something, did it, wasn't it? When meanwhile, the amount of damage done to, done to turtles and other sea life is off the chart when it comes to drift nets, etc. And somebody found a turtle who uh, was one in a million, got some straw, wedged up his nostril or something, pulled out the pair of pliers, and it went viral around the planet. Next thing you know, every single business, virtue signaling person on the planet is jumping on the war on plastic straws. Have you ever seen anything so insane? And then to have that thought reignited in your head when you see something like this, like these containers which are built today, single use items. Holy shit. But that's okay, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But it's those damn straws. We got to clean them up. <laughs> All right, bite my lip. Let's get into some important voices about the real world and real shit. Stuff that needs to be heard about and shared. This is titled, The Howl That Still Curls My Hair. Good day. Hope you're doing well. Feel free to use my story or part of it as it runs a little long. Late fall, early winter, 1980, in the rural mountains of North Carolina, near the Virginia, Tennessee border, in an area called Rowan's Creek. R-O-A-N-S Creek. I was 14. I spent the majority of those years hunting and fishing. In my 14 years, I was never over a two-minute walk from the woods. Living in a rural setting with those siblings, left me two options. One, sit on my ass, or two, get out in the woods. I loved the outdoors and spent every hour I could hunting or fishing. I had no fear of the woods. I would walk 45 minutes in total darkness to my deer stand, hunt all day, and return home after I could no longer see 10 feet in front of me. I never gave it a second thought. The woods were my private heaven. Little did I know, they would soon become my worst nightmare. I came home from school with my with time to grab the beagle, hunting vest, and my trusty 410 single shot. I ran across the road, down my great uncle's driveway, turned left up the old sawmill landing. I released Katie. She started her Z pattern, nose to the ground with an occasional whoop to assure me where she was. Katie was trained to circle the rabbit and push it back to the hunter. Unlike many dogs that you have to follow, I climbed up on a pile of old slabs to secure a better view, probably four to, feet, four to five foot high. She was cutting back and forth through mature white pines, 
between 30 to 40 foot high. They had been planted in nice straight rows after the depression ended, roughly 1933. The reason I mention the straight rows is you can picture how the setting sun's light would light up in the open areas. It would light up the open areas. I could see Katie crossing back and forth and occasional oop. She so very relaxing. Then out of nowhere, Katie yelped as if she was being hurt. We've all heard dogs in pain and scared. A long continuous crying yelp. I focused my sight in her area. About 80 yards out, nothing. Then her cries became further away as she ran away. Cries that went out of earshot, crying out the entire time. Like I could no longer hear her. <clears throat> My eyes never left the tall pines, and then I saw something moving through the rows. The sun was at an angle to my right. I could only see its shadow as it came closer. A bear? A horse? Uncle Rex? 7 yards, 60, 50. The landing of the old sawmill was about 30 yards long, circled with 4 to 5 foot high slab piles. I last saw it to my right at about 40 yards. I climbed, out of, I climbed off the slabs to my left. This allowed me to see up the rows as the slabs blocked the sun to my right. I eased along the slabs, moving closer to where I'd seen it. I swung out wider so I could see around the slabs at the end, and my world changed forever. The next 20 seconds takes 10 minutes to explain. Time moved in slow motion. As I can recall, every step I took and each eye blink. A horrid smell engulfed the area. Almost like a musk. A warm yet piercing. I'm sure you know what I mean by musk. If that makes sense. Every hair on my neck stood up. My senses were in overdrive. I wanted to throw up. I knew I was being watched and I knew it was close. I turned to my right, and just on the other side of the slabs was a Bigfoot, 15 yards away. I could see him from his waist up. His head was semi-pointed, no hair on the forehead, cheeks, or nose. Wide nose, thin lips, square teeth, with dark eyes. His shoulders were freaking huge, the size of basketballs. His chest was defined as well as any bodybuilder. Arms went past his knees, and they were... 27 to 29 inches thick. He had some guns. Hair color was dark, kind of gray slash brown. I froze. I told myself, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. I looked down, rubbed my eyes, and when I looked back up, he was still there. I rubbed my eyes again and dipped my head down to an angle. Still there. At this moment, I turned and ran maybe 10 yards. Again, I said, no such thing. A stop turned around and he had stepped up on the slab pile. My God, it was 10 feet tall, <clears throat> shoulders 4 feet wide, thighs 38 to 40 inches thick. I'd say it weighed, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd say it weighed 7 to 800 pounds. That's it. It is real. I threw my gun to my shoulder and then thought, I will only make this thing mad. I lowered the 410 to my waist. Keep in mind, I was looking this creature in his eyes. When I lowered my gun, time stood still. Hold on a second, what's that noise? Oh, roosters. When I lowered my gun, time stood still. I could hear him breathing. This may sound crazy, but I never felt threatened. The eyes were firm. But I didn't see evil. I leaned hard to my right so the setting sun would be hidden behind a large pine tree behind him. He leaned his head to the other side and gave a light exhale. Game over. When he moved, I turned and ran through the thorn brushes down the hill, jumped halfway over the creek, landing in the middle. I tripped coming out the other side, <clears throat> falling on my rear, just in time to see him following me down the bank. I could see my house 100 yards to go. I began screaming, Mom! Mom! I jumped over the barbed wire fence, catching my boot just on the tip, just enough to trip me up, just enough to turn my head and see him stop at the creek. My mother had heard my screams and was on the porch at the time, at, at the top of the stairs. I came flying up the steps. My jacket was torn to shreds by the bushes. My face was covered in scratches. 
My mom said, you are wet as a ghost. What happened? About that time, she asked, about, sorry, about the time she asked, this creature began a blood-curdling scream as it paced back and forth along the creek, just in the shadows of the pine trees. 10 to 15 minutes of pacing and screaming, it stayed there until well past dark. Mom kept asking, What did you do? What did, it, what did you make mad? Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. The next day, I come home, my mother says, get your gun and get up there and find Katie. She never came home. And you need to get back on the horse. It was probably a wild boar, and if you don't go back in the woods today, you will let fear win and never go back. I grabbed my 410, and out the door I went. <clears throat> I didn't make it four steps down, blood-curling death scream. My mom even said, stop and get back in here. You can see the shadow of this creature strutting back and forth about 20 feet back under the pine trees. After about five minutes, my great uncle called the house. Mom answered and asked what the hell was wrong with me and what was I yelling and screaming about. She informed him of what was occurring and he left it at that. That creature paced back and forth until dark. He would only yell when I came out. This went on for the next two days, but only when I was there. Finally, Saturday came. I was looking forward to catching up on the lost sleep. Nope. At the left of sunrise, a knock on the door. In walks my uncle, my grandfather, along with his two brothers, one of which owned the small, owned the sawmill. And the same great uncle that had called earlier in the week. We need you to come with us. Why in the hell did you tear up the sawmill? Uncle Rex is good. <clears throat> uncle Rex is good to you, and you repay him by throwing shit everywhere? We went together to see the sawmill. There were slabs everywhere. The entire landing was covered. I got one more ass chewing until I pointed out the 20-inch bear footprints and pointed out 300-pound chunks of stumps thrown around and the 22-foot steel I-beam guide for the mill tossed on its side. They looked at each other, walked around with hands on hips. Then across their chest, then they came back. Dick, we think it's best if you stay out of the woods for a while. No argument from me. Over the next couple of weeks, my great uncles would drive to the old sawmill about 30 minutes before dark, and I noticed their truck lights would come on from time to time throughout the night. I never heard the scream again, well, not from the sawmill, and not for 38 years. I'll never know why it screamed, why it paced, or why it came back that week. If it had wanted to get me, it had me at the sawmill, and it never ran after me, it just followed me. End of story. What's your thoughts? Your personal story stands the hair up on my neck, but I think there are some of us who believe we are attached to nature. We have our sixth sense working, where most people have had it bred out of them. I know when I'm being watched. I know what I smell. I have no doubt that these beings know who can see them or sense them. I've had numerous tree knocks, too many to remember. I've had six to seven rocks thrown near me different times, and even had a rock tossed at me in my tree stand. I think rock throwing is just a warning, not to hit us, and even sometimes just playing. I feel these beings around me. I feel no threat from 99%, but every now and then I get the feeling of get the hell out of here, as if some of these creatures might not be as forgiving if we walk up on them. I could go on for hours. My wife and I live in rural North Carolina mountains, about a mile from Tennessee, on 100 acres, mostly wooded. We respect all wildlife. We only kill what we're going to eat and to see that the animals have food during the winter. I think they know our hearts. They know we're never going to shoot at them or bring a news crews or bring in news crews to try and film them, etc. I'm sure you have hundreds of stories also. Not all encounters. <clears throat> Not all encounters last three minutes. Most are just simple tree knocks, rocks, smells, and the knowing they are watching. That uneasy feeling. I don't expect you to read this novel. Maybe you'll like the main story. I have some pics also. Just got to find where I put them. I'll send you another email with the pics. Sorry, so long-winded. I use up on the next report. P.S. Can't believe you didn't leave that meth head under some stump for grizzly bait. What a scumbag. <laughs> Best wishes, Richard. Okay, man. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't either.
There you go. There's a print splayed out toes. 18 incher. Hmm. There you go, man. Hopefully I remember to put this freaking photo in the video. And that's the shitty thing, you guys, is when I... Not the shitty thing, but how I screw up with the photos. Hold on, before I start going off. Richard, I appreciate you sending me this email, man. It's a while ago. This is probably three years old from a folder that I found in the Tell My Story emails. There's a, over a thousand in there, not red, and that's where I grabbed it. And I think they all seem to be 2020 or 2019 or something like that. But anyway... I believe you are correct when you say, when you feel that once they know, you know. That's all there is to it, right? I believe that as well. Once they know, you know, they let you know from time to time, right? I don't know why they, they seem to leave me alone for the most part in some of the crazy places I go. I don't know why, but I do know in the beginning I was, I wasn't, the thoughts I would carry in my head and the words I would let out of my mouth were absolute vulgar and violent, violence filled. When I would be doing my hike in the dark, up the mountain or wherever, I'd be saying, you F with me, I'm going to put as many holes in your F and ass as I can. F, I was just going off, right? As, But you know what? Fright being scared is anger, right? It's the same thing. It, it, it makes you react in anger, extreme fright. Look what happens when you scare the shit out of your mom or your dad on purpose. Oh, quit doing it. You know, they do instantly angry. Oh, don't do that again. You know, it doesn't make you lock your face off being scared, right? And I always say, I'm not scared of shit. <clears throat> what I'm, when I do say that I'm not scared of shit, what am I trying to say? I'm maybe trying to say that I'm not going to let fright ruin it for me. You know what I mean? It's like, no. <clears throat> I'm not giving in. I might be apprehensive, but I'm not going to let that turn me into, it's not going to let me show my belly. I'm not going to do it. You know what I mean? I'm going to keep going. And that's not being a tough guy. You know, a lot of people also say, oh yeah, you're a tough guy. Why am I a tough guy? Because I'll stand up for myself? Because I'll speak the truth no matter what anybody thinks? Is that being a tough guy? That should, that should be your average human being as far as I'm concerned, right? We speak the truth. And we don't back down from anybody, period, <laughs> right? That's not being a tough guy or a badass. That's being normal as far as I'm concerned. And everybody should carry themselves that way. I should stop and bite my lip. Anyway, if you're still, if you're still sharing with us or if you're watching, make sure you email me back again, all right? If you did send me more pictures, I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll remember to do a search in your name in the inbox here, see if we can find them, all right? And when I get, what I'm getting to about the sharing photos is, so I'll have the photo in my notes, <clears throat> excuse me, where this is here, right? In my notes, and I'll leave here. When I get to the editing program, well now I have to save that photo to my phone. Then I have to crack open Dropbox, and then I have to load that photo onto Dropbox, and then I have to crack open Dropbox on the laptop, and then I have to download that photo from Dropbox and laptop onto the editing program and put it in the video. So you understand why I forget to put a lot of these photos in the videos. Okay, you guys, that's why. It can be a little bit of a cluster on my end. Now, moving along. I'm battling my head off. I gotta stop it. This next one's titled Two Stories. Okay, I'll make this as quick as I can. I have two stories to tell. First one happened about three years after getting out of the Navy, about 1973. I was hunting in the Atchafalaya Basin. Atchafalaya Basin. Atchafalaya Basin. A-T-C-H-A-F-A-L-A-Y-A -A -A Basin. South Central Louisiana. My father, myself, and my friend and hunting mentor, Frank. Frank was the best hunter and woodsman I have ever even till today, no. He was part Native American and had a sixth sense about nature unlike anyone else I've known. We were hunting about 1.5 miles from any road. The basin was flooded and we were hunting in water from six inches to four feet deep. Frank killed a nice, Frank killed a nice little four-point buck. My daddy and I went to meet him just about 300 yards away. It was decided that daddy would take the guns and go on out the woods to the truck then wait for Frank and me to float the buck out, which is easier than dragging or pulling a deer out. But to do so, we would have to travel through the woods on a different route than Daddy, than Daddy and would take us a little longer. 
As we were floating the deer out, I realized that something was paralleling us on the left side, about 30 yards away in the thick cypress trees. We were alone, except for Daddy, who was now at least five or six hundred yards ahead of us. We had a pole cut about six feet long and a rope tied in the middle, and each of us having the pole across our waist. We were walking side by side. I stopped when I heard the footsteps and looked behind us off to the left and saw nothing. When I turned around, Frank was looking at me with an amused look. I asked him, do you hear that? He smiled and said yes and started walking again. The walking off to the left started again. I stopped again. But when I turned around, I caught a glimpse of black go behind a tree. The problem was, the black was up in the, was up in the tree, not at water level. I saw water rippling in the swamp, but the black movement was too high to be in the water, I thought. Frank told me, let's go, don't worry, don't worry with him. This confused me. Frank knew him. This, this time, instead of facing the direction we were walking, I turned and walked looking back, at which time I saw a tall black figure passing between the trees. At this time, I started really putting an effort into pulling the buck out. Frank just chuckled and told me that I did not have to worry. Let's just get to the truck. The splashing sound of walking followed on the side of us another 15 to 20 minutes until we arrived at the truck. We loaded the deer, and I turned to my dad to tell what happened. Frank put his hand on my shoulder, looked me in the eyes, and just barely shook his head no. I did not speak of it that day, or any day for years. Then telling the story only once to some younger hunters who just laughed and gave me the you're full of shit look. I've not spoken of it again until this email. You write about one thing for sure. Once you've experienced such, have an experience such as this, the woods are never the same. No, they're not. <clears throat> not at all. Years later, maybe 20 or so, I had stayed in my deer stand until dark 30 in the same general area. That night I heard the distinctive loud knocks. I said to myself at the time, damn, I wish I had not heard that, but I had. I left carefully and alertly and went back to my little camp about two miles away. I had bourbon and said, this is for you, Frank, as it reminded me of Frank and our time together. But I was not as afraid as the first time, but very aware. And that's the end of that one. And man, too bad we couldn't have heard from Frank, right? He knew something. And there's, but there's another person saying, no, don't say, don't say anything. Why? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why do we keep, keep on saying, don't say anything? It can be frustrating, right? Frustrating for me. I just wish that people, I don't know where they get the don't say anything part. Where do they get that from? I don't understand that. It's confusing for me. It's a confusing common trait amongst human beings when it comes to much. And it frustrates me. I want people to dump that characteristic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't not say anything ever when it comes to anything. Say it. Say it, say it, say it. But anyway, appreciate you emailing, man. I'd love to hear from, too bad we couldn't hear from Frank. Hear him let us know what's up. What does he know? You know? All right, <clears throat> excuse me, we got, here's another one. Okay, this one's titled Hunting Camp Encounters. Hi Steve, I live in Southwest Washington, do most of my hunting in the High Cascades. Currently 63 years old and I've been fishing and hunting my whole life, mostly archery. So tracking and reading signs is what I do. I first found footprints back in 74, but it wasn't until the late 90s in my hunting camp that things started to happen. I've been camping in the same spot since 1990, and to this day, I still spend the archery season there. The first encounter up there, the thing came in and peed on the front and the back door of my army tent at three in the morning. Since then, every encounter aside from seeing the damn thing has happened. Tree knocks so loud they woke you up, pushing trees over, hoots, rocks placed on my kitchenette, rocks stacked behind camp, trees jammed into the ground upside down, and occasionally the hairs on the back of my neck alert me. Something isn't right. One night we packed an elk out, got back to camp a little after three in the morning. Twenty minutes later we heard the craziest language right outside the tent, which ended with a growl. 
So far I've found tracks up there three times, one of which was 20 inches. From what I've witnessed, there is no doubt of its existence. I think I'll write a book. I hate Sasquatch. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You can use Colby if you want to tell this. Okay, Colby. P.S. So far, three in camp have seen it, and I don't care to. Keep up the good work. Okay, man, if you're still watching, and maybe possibly you could send us what went down when, you're, when your partner's seen it, all right? We want to hear about it. And uh, I'd probably be a fan of that book myself. I hate Sasquatch <laughs> at times, right? Especially when it's dark and you're in the timber by yourself. Okay, what's this one? Appreciate you, man. I hope you're still with us. Hi there, Steve. I just want to tell someone about my experience at my farm in Tennessee. I just want to tell what's been going on over here the past few years. I don't feel like I can really have a discussion with any person I know about it. You know the way friends sit around at a table and just accept what you're saying? Yeah, there's no person I can chat with. I just more or less like to tell the stories and get it out there. These beings, as you describe, or woods people, as I've started calling them, are ranging through my farm. I've not seen one. My son has. But it may not be long before I do. The background of my place is that I'm building an off-grid house near Norris Lake in Tennessee. I have solar panels and don't really believe in lighting the place up like a runway at night. I live in a cabin till the house is done, and at night I appreciate the stars being visible. I like to do things naturally without scabbing up my land, and one of my hobbies is foraging in the forest for wild food. There's something to eat out there basically all year, and given the climate, forest is like a rainforest in the summer. I've identified places where there is reliable food available at different times of the year. The nutrition that you can get from plants that are deep-rooted and growing in the forest soil is pretty amazing. I raise my own meat, chicken and sheep, and occasionally get deer meat from friends who hunt. I'm out there a lot. I'm happiest when I'm outside, but anyhow, here's a list of the things that happened in the past three years. Number one. My oldest son, about 12 years old, three years ago, popped his head out of the deer blind window, look up the hill. He was on the neighboring prop farm property, and there's a hill about a half a mile away, and he saw a large, dark, human-like figure striding across the hayfield and dirt road going up the hill. He immediately said it was a Bigfoot. <clears throat> the family friend that was with him acted like he was crazy. He said it was too big to be a human and pretty much dark all over. I believe my son because pretty much my experience in the forest has me convinced that we don't really know jack about, about being out there. Let's just say humans are so separated from the natural world that we don't notice things. Agreed, for the most part. I've started to develop a feeling there's a lot more out there going on, and we don't even know how to look at stuff, at stuff the right way to be able to consider more than a percentage of all the possibilities. Number two. About this time, we finished the timber frame on the house. I'd started camping out there so I could start w working on the house at sunrise. I put up a six-person tent would camp there on the weekend. Sometimes my kids will stay with me in the tent, sometimes it'd just be me by myself. At that point, we still had our house in the city, which was an hour drive away. One Saturday night, I'd say late in June, maybe 2016, 15, I just woke up in the middle of the night, probably about two in the morning. I'm not sure if I'd heard something or had an odd feeling. It just startled me out of my sleep. I was by myself, but what I heard was unbelievable. There's a hill line about a half mile from us, same hillside where my son saw it, on the farm next door. I heard a scream, not a person scream, not an owl, it's not a coyote. It's not even a mountain lion. I know what all those things sound like. This sounded like a human, but louder and deeper, and resonating like it came out of a big chest cavity and lungs. The interesting part of it next is that the scream repeated about five more times, originating a sequence from several places along the ridge line. It sounded like something was screaming as it ran in bursts. I knew it wasn't any human because it covered the distance of that entire ridge line in seconds and letting out a holler every so often as it moved. There's no human that can run that fast. There's no officially recognized animal that I know that can make that sound. What felt really creepy about it 
was somehow it felt like those screams were directed at me, alone in my tent down below. It was meant I was meant to hear those. I told a couple of friends about this and of course I got the blank stare. One person told me it was a screech owl, and I told her I never heard a baritone screech owl before. Number three. Our chickens are kept out in the hay field in portable chicken coops that we move with the pickup truck every few days. On the far edge of the hay field is a sinkhole. This part of Tennessee has a lot of underground cave structures that often collapse, and this sinkhole is about five acres of land. It's an old sinkhole, still sliding down, but stable enough that 18-inch diameter trees are growing all through it. On the rim, on the rim closest to my farm is a big patch of pawpaw trees, and those things have really delicious fruit. Anyhow, my sons were out feeding the chickens at those portable coops near the side that had the pawpaws. As the boys were going to, in to feed the chickens, something in the woods in the patch of pawpaws let out a sequence of terrible growls. The boys said they were really deep growls, really loud, and made them feel a panic feeling inside their gut. The boys ran out of that field. They don't really like going in that part of the woods anymore. I used to have them pick fruit for me, but they've not been back since they got growled at. Number four, our farm is covered in blackberry bushes. Every year I pick several gallons to do jam and wine and juice. There's a good patch over near that sinkhole, not too far from where the pawpaws are. I was out there one afternoon picking when I noticed that small pebbles were being thrown at me. They weren't hitting me, but were falling through the blackberries and I could hear them bouncing off leaves and hitting the ground. I didn't feel particularly threatened, but I knew immediately what was going on. There was a woods person nearby, and I was getting their blackberries. By this time, I developed sense that I need to make peace with myself, that these people are out there. I decided at that moment that I would sing it a song. The pebble throwing stopped, and I kept picking the blackberries till my bucket was full. Keep in mind that I could pick for a lifetime and probably not clean off those bushes. There were so many berries out there. I honestly can get the impression that this being was just tooling with me. There is starting to be a pattern of collisions with these guys in important food areas. Number five. My 13 year old daughter reports that something tapped his fingernails on her sleeping loft window one night. Her window was at least 12 feet off the ground. Number six. Our temporary cabin is off-grid. We have no air conditioning and no central heat. In the summertime, all the windows are open. I like to look out the window, look at the stars in my loft if I'm not able to sleep. I also like to listen to the sound of the forest at night through the open window. No air conditioner and no neighbors makes for a pretty quiet evening in the summertime. I often hear yells in the woods closer to the lakefront. One time there was a deep baritone howl. It went on for several seconds, and just as I decided that it was a woods person, the sound mutated into a coyote yip. Pretty tricky. I don't really think I figured out how to coexist with these guys yet. I hope that my deep respect for the natural world could resonate with them, maybe in a small way, because I think they're a smart and reasoning bunch. There is so much wild food around here. Blackberries, wild cherries, autumn olive, pawpaws, black walnuts, hazelnuts, hazelnuts, persimmons, acorns, passion fruit, may pops, the list goes on. Same thing I appreciate they rely on. Of course, I've also planted an extensive apple orchard up on top of one of those hills, and I've never yet mentioned to the, mentioned the edible fo foliage plants, mushrooms, herbs, and medicinal plants that are all over the place. I don't think it's too big of a stretch to try to further develop it and etiquette around taking my desired share of this food. I always operate under the principle of taking no more than 10% of what I see. Hopefully I won't be considered a jerk in their eyes. I didn't get the impression they're here all the time. Of course, there's a better than average probability that I'm wrong about that. My impression is, is that they pass through here and they, and they're on a route to gather food. By the way, I've looked for these structures the woods people supposedly build and have never found one. I've never found anything woven, and there are a lot of broken trees out in the forest. I'm really not interested in contacting Bigfoot investigators. Why would something slash someone that belongs here first need to be investigated? <laughs> not really interested in broadcasting my stories, more or less just hoping I can put it out there in a summary and know that it's with someone that will accept it. 
Still looking for that person I can openly discuss it with in person around here and theorize and try to figure it out. Kind regards, Jen. Jen, appreciate that. That's well, that lifestyle you have chosen. A lot of people are going to envy envy you for that. But then again, on the other hand, that's a lot of hard work, right? A lot of hard work <clears throat> living off grid. I've done it for three months at a time in the north, but it's not easy, right? I appreciate you sending that in. If you're still with us, maybe possibly send us an update update email. What's going on? What have you learned? And and uh, have you met anybody around your area? who can relate to what you're experiencing. And if you have felt pressure change or witnessed any balls of light since you've been there, I'd be interested in hearing about that. So I hope you're still with us healthy and happy. And if you are still following us, share away, all right? Share some more if you can, especially, especially if it'll help somebody or yourself. All right, here we go, one more. Now I'm gonna get my butt moving. This is titled, Our Night of Horror. Steve, so glad to hear each and every encounter you shared, and thank you for this channel, for those of us ridiculed for our experiences. I've told my story to a few people, mostly my family, and they know my integrity and that I would have no reason to lie. I share my story to let others know these beings are real. August 84, three friends and myself are camping in the woods not too far from our homes. It was the end of summer vacation, and we just wanted to get in the last hoorah before starting back to school. We constructed a heavy-duty lean-to structure from large logs nailed into trees with old planks nailed to the roof. We built a nice fire pit and collected plenty of wood to last us for a couple days. My friends and I got to our site at around 4 p.m. We were having a great time throughout the night. Myself and my friend Dave were on our sleeping bags facing toward the shelter. On the other side of the fire pit, along with his, along with his dog, a collie, <clears throat> our other friends were inside the shelter along with a female husky, and she was very protective of her owner. Around 11 p.m., as we were laughing and telling our tales of girls and our great fails of the summer, then all the talking stopped <clears throat> when the youngest boy with us said, Shh, do you guys hear that? We all just laughed at him as he was the one most likely to get spooked anyway. Just a minute or so later, Dave, the friend I was outside the shelter with, said, I heard something the same at that time. Sorry, I heard something that time. I think we need to leave. We all began looking at each other in a stupor as if something was getting ready to happen. And did it ever. Our dogs started pacing back and forth with their tails between their legs, whining as if they had just been scolded. They were smelling something that was different with their noses in the air. And then, like a clap of thunder, there was a loud roar behind our shelter. Just let me, let me just say we shot out of those woods like a cannon. While running, we could hear a loud type of gibberish chasing us as we were tripping on deadfall and crashing into trees running through briars and anything else we could stumble into. It was, it was pure adrenaline as we were running through those woods with no light. Somehow, three of us and the large husky named Lady managed to make it back to the wood line, to a house which happened to have a street light by the road. We realized that Dave was missing, as well as his collie. We began calling for him, and just a minute or two later, the lady that lived in the house came to the porch, wondering what all the commotion was about. So we told her the best we could while trying to get a response from our friend. And at last we saw a glint of white coming towards us. It was our friend carrying his dog. And this is not a small dog either, it's 60 pounds or so. Anyway, as he was walking toward us, he said while stammering in his speech to us, Guys, what's behind me? It's behind me. We couldn't see anything, nor did we want to. The lady that owned the house told us all to get inside. We explained to her what had happened in detail, so she called the county sheriff, in which they never showed up, by the way. This wonderful lady took us in and told us we could stay in her basement, so she gave us some sleeping bags, blankets, and as we were settling in for the night, her youngest daughter let out a scream from upstairs. We all rushed up the stairs as she was telling her mother she heard something at the back door and went to look, thinking there may have been someone else that had been ran out of the woods. When she looked out there, there was a large, 
hairy arm that passed by the door. Wow, right? What can you make of that from 1984, as Sasquatch was thought to be some silly idiotic thing or a man in a monkey suit in California? We never gave it much thought, believed it or... We never gave it much thought, believe it or not, after that incident. But what chased us out of those woods or made the blood-curdling sounds this thing made? Back home and years later, after my hips in the army was over, I purchased my first PC and had always been fascinated with the topic since my youth and being stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington from 87 to 90 while in the U.S. Army, where, by the way, I had an encounter. Sorry, where, by the way, I never had an encounter, fortunately. Anyway, one night I was research researching this being when I ran across the Ron Moorhead recordings, and then everything took me back to that night. I was amazed. This chatter that was chasing us that night, damned I had been in the presence of Sasquatch, not in Washington, not in Washington State or BC, but the little Appalachian Mountains where I live now. Thanks for sharing, Wayne Hampton, Tennessee. Well, thanks to you, thanks, thanks to you for sharing, Wayne. Man, what a shitty, terrifying frickin' What a terrifying thing to be a child, you know, young kids in the woods having fun with all your buddies. No adults, no weapons, no nothing, and then the worst of anything you could ever come up with happens for real, right? For real. But anyway, I gotta get moving. I got a lot to do, but God, this is making me want to puke not going in the woods. I think in a few days I'm gonna have to go back to those uh, coastal mountains in a few days and go hike and uh, look for shed antlers in my spots and um, get my keep my connection going right I can get kind of cuckoo when I work at the farm here for too long I gotta get in the mountains I have to go or else I go crazy and uh, I still have to get those trail cameras in the rainforest there in the in the uh, Carmana that's that's in the back of my mind too because I'm not absolutely familiar with the area, but I am familiar with how many frickin' sightings and shit goes on around there. It's right off the chart. And where I left these cameras is kind of creepy. It's full-on, big, mature, never logged before timber along a riverbed. And the trails in there are huge. The trees are frickin' huge. It's remote. I'll, I'll film it. I'll film the whole hike. And take you guys in there with me. And then we'll have a look at what's on the trail cameras too. Hopefully they're still in the trees, right? But anyway, share my story at howtohunt.com. Get it, get it to me. I'll share it. If you want to go fishing, book it at howtohunt.com. I understand, sir, said there's a lot of people that can't come because they don't have the frickin' jab. Canada's stan isn't letting people into the country unless they have something jammed in the body that doesn't do shit. I'll bite my lip on that one. Talk to you guys shortly. <laughs>